Let's start our journey at the, at the beginning, the start of our disaster. Everyone knows that the human race is in serious trouble. Uh, the world is in trouble. The, the, the world is filled with tumult, filled with pain and cruelty and trouble all around us. It's in the news. I think every single human being in the earth today is aware that we as a civilization, as a people, as a species are in big trouble. And there seems to be no solution to the crises that are surrounding us. All of this started at the beginning. So let's go back to the start of our disaster. Well, at the start of the story, God created man. And his original plan was that we should be in his image and be just like him. To share the nature and the character of God. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 reading from the New King James Version. Then God said, this is in Genesis chapter 1, right at the beginning. God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God is making man, his intention is that man would have dominion, that man would rule, man would govern what God was creating in the earth. God placed man in a location called Eden and gave him commands on what he was permitted to do and what he was not allowed to do. This is very important because you're back at the beginning of how man came into being when God created man. And what we discover is that as part of the correctness of creation, there were certain boundaries. There were boundaries. All of this was, was core to what man was. Man was supposed to live in certain acknowledged boundaries. God told him what he was permitted to do and told him what he was not allowed to do. He could eat the fruit of all the trees in the garden except one, one particular tree that he was absolutely forbidden to touch or to eat from. The man Adam and his wife Eve, they disobeyed God. They broke the command, plunging himself and his entire environment into darkness and into disaster. Man broke the boundary. Uh, Whatever the story is, whatever the tree was, whatever the fruit was, the principle is that man broke the boundary that was placed upon him for his own good by God. The system of boundaries that was an essential part of the order of creation, was shattered. The boundaries were put in place to separate light from darkness, to separate order from disorder, to separate good from evil. That's what the boundaries are for. The boundaries are put to keep man safe, to make sure that we could live in safety and in order all the days of our life. Man shattered the boundaries. And the penalty for disobedience was very swift and very severe. We see that in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. Let's go read that. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. God is speaking. After man has transgressed or broken the boundaries, man has sinned before God. To the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. However, women gave birth before that, I have no idea. What was the plan of God? But this was part of the penalty of shattering the boundaries and disobeying God. I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. To Adam, he says, because you listen to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground. Because of you. Cursed is the ground because of you. And through painful toil. Toil means hard labor. 
you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. Verse 19, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. That statement there brings death into the human experience. Death and decay. You were taken from the dust. I created you from the raw elements of the earth. And you will die and return to dust. And it is true. When a human being dies and is put into the ground, they turn right back into dust. From dust you were, and dust you will return. So death comes in. The penalty for disobedience is very severe. So what do we see as our disaster? Well, first of all, there's a painful arrival into this life, into time and into mortality. A painful arrival. Secondly, there's conflict between the sexes exploded into the earth. That, that conflict between male and female, the conflict between the sexes exploded into the earth. Even our physical environment got cursed. You know for a fact that if you just leave a piece of ground, weeds will grow on it. You will never reflexively see uh, crops that can feed you automatically springing forth from the earth. Weeds will grow. You have to control weeds. You have to fertilize crops. You have to make the ground bring forth that which is beneficial for you. The physical environment is cursed. Toil and labor became the portion of man. You have to work. You have to sweat. You have to become exhausted. You have to go out in the frustration of daily toil and labor in order to live. Physical death overtakes man. And he will return to the dust from which he came. Because time will defeat every human being. It doesn't matter what you do. The older you get, the weaker you get. And ultimately, time will defeat you. For we all will die. Close fellowship and relationship between God and man was broken. This is the disaster that the human race has fallen into. And out of that disaster is produced all of the pain in the earth. All of the wars. All of the cruelty. All of the abuse. All of the negativity that we hear every day is produced out of the fact that man did not obey what God told him to do. The source of all this disaster and the one who pollutes the heart of man is a powerful spirit being named Satan. Satan is the one who came into the garden and deceived man. The word Satan means the opposer. The one who opposes everything that God wants to establish. Satan deceives and seduces man to rebel against the command of God. He promises beauty when in fact there is ugliness. He says that things will be okay when in fact by his action, man is destroying himself. The same principles still exist in the earth today. The same principles of deception, false promises, people looking for something that they never attain. And the end of it all is ugliness, pain, and loss. That same principle exists in the earth today. Let's talk about the negative spiritual environment that we find ourselves in. The great disobedience in the Garden of Eden causes a dark, negative, spiritual environment to come to the forefront in two areas. Something happened when man disobeyed God back in Genesis in the early days of creation. Two things came to the forefront that are still at the forefront of all human suffering today. The first thing is the internal corruption in the heart of man. The heart, meaning the inside structure of man, in his thoughts, in his emotions, in his motivations. The heart of the human experience. The internal corruption in the heart of man. This is the book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. This is what the Bible says. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And then he gives a list, sexual immorality, stealing or theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness. Lewdness is uncleanness of every level. 
envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All of these evils come from inside and defile a person. Defiling means that what comes from the inside causes a person's environment to rot and produces inaccurate action that they then perpetrate. So from the heart comes the defilement. Out of a person's heart, evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, all of what we see in the earth today comes from the heart of man. And that is what happened when man initially disobeyed God. There was an internal corruption of the heart. So there's corruption from the inside to the outside. Secondly, the second thing that we see that caused a negative spiritual environment is that the disobedience caused the rise and the empowerment of an evil system of spiritual governors over the earth. A system of spirit governors over the earth. The great disobedience in the Garden of Eden caused a dark, negative spiritual environment to have power to act in the earth and to inflict suffering and darkness in the lives of men. Nobody can see it. This is in the invisible dimensions of human life. But in the invisible dimensions of human life, there are dark spirit governors that have been unleashed through human disobedience that now inflict suffering and darkness in the lives of men. They create wars. They create hunger, they create famines, they create disease, they create the problems that man faces in the earth. Look at these scriptures in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. We're just jumping into this and looking for a principle. As for you, the writer says, you were dead in your transgressions and in your sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. You follow the ways of this world. And the ways of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And that opens up a whole dimension of human life. That we now understand there is a kingdom of the air. In the spirit realm. A kingdom. An organized system of government. In the air. And we on earth, walking in transgressions and sins, are following the ways of this world and the ways of the kingdom of the air, the spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient. That was empowered and unleashed upon us when man disobeyed God. Here's another scripture. It's in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. It says, our struggle, the struggle that we have, is not against flesh and blood, but we struggle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There it is again. And this scripture gives us the organized system of evil that is all around us. Rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So these are two areas of a negative spiritual environment that was unleashed because man disobeyed God and broke the boundaries. Number one, internal corruption arose from inside of his heart. But number two, a system of evil in the spirit realm was empowered and unleashed. And we live in the midst of that. We live in the midst of a system of evil erupting from within and also the oppression of spirits that live in the kingdom of the air. And that is the structure of human life. In verse 11, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6, this is what we are told. Put on the full armor of God. And people put on armor to defend themselves. You put on armor to do two things. One, to enable you to fight successfully. And two, to defend yourselves. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That word schemes means his devices, his tricks, his entrapments, or his seductions. So that system of the kingdom of the air has schemes, devices. It tricks you. It entraps you. It seduces you. It sets things around you to make you fall, to seduce you, to break you, to destroy your life. 
And he says, put on the armor of God, defend yourself so that you can take your stand and resist. The word taking your stand means resist and overcome. You can resist and overcome the devil's devices, his tricks, his entrapments and his seductions. These verses tell us that we are surrounded by a whole invisible system of darkness that is seeking to destroy everything good in our lives. And that is what the disobedience to God unleashed upon us. So this is the situation. This is our situation. Man has failed the expectation of God and has fallen deep into a state or into a condition of sin. Man, human beings, the human condition has failed the expectation of God and has fallen deep into a state of sin. What is the situation? Man has no way to help or deliver himself. He has no way to cause himself to return to a state of acceptance before God. In other words, he is lost. He is lost. Man without God is lost. He has no way to help or deliver himself. All he can do is fight, toil, and be oppressed by the system of the kingdom of the air. What is the situation? Dark powers have been unleashed in the heavenly realms. And they are intent on destroying man and disallowing any return to a relationship with God. That is our situation. What is the situation? The heart of man, the core of man is polluted. And the way back to God is closed. And man cannot find the way. That's the situation the human race finds itself in. Into that situation enters a hero. Enter the hero. And the hero is Jesus Christ. We looked at this situation. We looked at this genesis. We looked at what started it. We looked at what it unleashed. And we looked at the condition of man in the earth. And into that hopelessness, into that situation, enters a hero. And that hero's name is Jesus Christ. God himself sends Jesus into the world. He is conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin woman called Mary. It's a miraculous thing. The earth celebrates his literal physical birth every day. In a festival that is called Christmas or Christmas. The coming of Christ. He was born in Bethlehem in the Middle East. In a stable, in poverty, in a family. He was conceived in the womb of a virgin. Her name is Mary. He is heaven sent, but he's earth born. That's very important. He's heaven sent. He's not sent by the earth. He is heaven sent, but he's earth born. In him for the first time, there is a perfect meeting of the purity and the righteousness of heaven with human mortality and the time-based life of the earth. He is the meeting point of systems that could never come together. Heaven sent, but earth born. That's the mystery of Christ. In him for the very first time, there's a perfect meeting of the purity and the righteousness of heaven with human mortality and the time-based life of the earth. He is one with God. And he's of God. He is the son of God. This is God. In sending Jesus. Expressing his love towards us. First John chapter 4. And verse 9. In this the love of God. Was manifested towards us. That God sent his only begotten son. Into the world. That we might live. Through him. It's very clear. Very clear when you look at the things step by step. When you look at the disaster that befell us, that we caused through disobedience, we represented in the first man, Adam. We see what that unleashed. The corruption is unleashed inside the heart of man. You don't have to teach children to lie. You have to teach them to speak the truth. We come from the womb with corruption on the inside of us. You have to teach them to be honorable. You have to teach them to be honest. You have to teach them to speak the truth. It unleashed corruption in the heart of man, but it empowered a dark invisible realm 
whose aim is to destroy and to afflict us, and we can't help ourselves. A great hero comes from heaven. He's born as a mortal out of the womb of a woman, but he's not of the earth. He's heaven sent. He's earth born. And in doing this, God is expressing his love towards us. The love of God was manifested or made open, was revealed, was made plain for all to see. That's the meaning of the word manifested. God made his love plain for all to see. So that every man would know that their creator actually loves them. In this, the love of God was manifested. God sent his only begotten son into this world for a reason. That we might live through him. Not die, but live. Not be hopeless, but have hope. Not have no answers, but have a solution. Not be defeated, but come to victory. He is, Jesus, not just a good man. He is good, but he's not just a good man. He is holy, but he's not just a holy man. He arrived in earth with a mission. And the mission was given to him by his father. The mission is to break the power of sin that afflicts all men. To break that power. The power of sin that makes people tilt towards wrongness and doing evil. He came to break the power of sin that afflicts all men. He came to offer salvation to all who were lost. Salvation is a saving grace. To all who were lost and on the way to judgment and hell. And thus to return us to a state of acceptability before God. He came to provide man with the assurance of an eternal future. And a guarantee of life after mortal death. He comes here with a mission. And that mission is still alive in the earth. That mission is still being executed. That mission touched my life 48 years ago. When I walked into a church. Didn't know him was going in the wrong direction, and he opened the door. That's why he came. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says this, a very important scripture. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. To seek means to search out, to search for you, to look for you, to track you down, to create opportunities to you. To be saved. The son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. To search for you and to find you. He creates opportunities. The opportunity may be a friend you spoke to. The opportunity may be some people found Christ in sickness. That because they got sick, they turned to God. Or some people had an, a friend who led them to God. The son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. He came to search for you. And to find you, every one of us sitting here today that knows God, he searched for you. Tracked you down in your circumstances, in your life events, through negative and positive circumstances, through blessing and difficulties. All created by him to bring you to a moment of clarity and decision. He came to seek you and to find you. God wants to find us. He also came to save us from destruction and to give us a future. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 3 to 7, I want to read this because it starts, Jesus told them this story. So let's go back in time and let's sit where Jesus is talking. And Jesus is telling them a story. And we want to hear the story that Jesus told to these disciples and people sitting around him. So Jesus told them this story. He says this, If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will that man do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search, search for the one that is lost until he finds it? What a beautiful statement. Will he not search until he finds? Will he not search for you until he finds you? And we hear the determination of God to come into your life to make a good way for you. In verse 5, And when he has found that sheep, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. 
He now supports it. He picks it up. He puts that sheep on his shoulders. He's taking that sheep back to safety. His divine power now working on your behalf to bring you to where you should be. When he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors and they will say, rejoice with me because I've found my lost sheep. In the same way, he says, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and who have not strayed away. This is Jesus telling a story, giving us an insight into the heart of God and what really is taking place. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and who have not strayed away. It tells you of the joy that breaks out in the visible realm in heaven when someone turns to God. For each one of us sitting here today who has come to know Jesus Christ, there was a moment when joy broke out in heaven over your life. You may not be aware of it. You were not aware at the time. But at the time you committed your life to Jesus Christ, there was rejoicing in the upper realm. Joy broke out in heaven. More than 99 who are righteous and have not strayed away. This is the heart and the nature of the God who created us. Then Jesus tells another story in Luke chapter 15 and verse 8 to 10. He says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Won't she light a lamp, sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? Sweep the whole house and search carefully until she finds it. If you feel, listening to my voice, a sense of being drawn to God or a sense of conviction rising in your heart, you need to understand, light a lamp is sweep the entire house that God has searched carefully to bring you to that moment. And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and her neighbors and she will say, Rejoice with me because I've found my lost coin in the same way. In other words, use that principle for your life. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Two stories, both indicating something very significant. That the joy of God, the celebration of God, in heaven falls upon the life of the one who turns and comes to the Lord. Well, let's look at the operations of the mission. We have seen what the mission of Jesus is. And his mission is to seek and to save those who are lost. His mission is to search carefully. His mission is to sweep the whole house. His mission is to track down every circumstance of your life. It's to meet you at a foreordained, determined time when he will open a door for you. I'm praying if you're listening to my voice anywhere in the earth that today, this moment, is the moment, is the ordained moment. That you're listening to my voice and you're hearing in your heart the conviction of the reality that God has come into your life and that he's opening a door, that he has swept the house, he has searched through every circumstance, he's found you. He wants to lift you on his shoulders and take you back with joy to a place of safety. Let's look at the operations of the mission. John chapter 1 verse 28 to 29 as we track it through the scriptures. This encounter took place in Bethany. Bethany is just a village or a town. It is an area east of the Jordan River where John was baptizing. So John the Baptist was baptizing people in that river. And the next day, John saw Jesus. Jesus is about to start his ministry upon the earth. John is the forerunner, the one who came before him to open the way. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, walking up the, up, up the street. And John said something very significant, very important. I want you to hear this very carefully. John says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how he describes Jesus. He calls him the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now he's saying that, 
John is talking to Jewish people who have a history of interacting with God right through the Old Testament. Their history goes right back to Moses. And in saying that, John is triggering something in the earth. Because that statement takes us back to Moses and his struggle to lead the people of God out of Egypt in the days of the Pharaoh. Horrific plagues are falling from heaven as God is breaking the power of an empire and then something incredible happens. Let's read about that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 to 23. We're looking for a principle here in a story that took place a long time ago. Moses called the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourself according to your families and kill what he calls the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb. There's going to be in the night the last dreadful plague that will come upon Egypt. The angel of death is going to come down into the earth. And the firstborn of every household is going to die on that night. The firstborn of all the herds in the fields of every cow is going to die that night. It's going to be a plague the like of which has never been seen on the earth before. It's coming. At the end of that plague, the Pharaoh, who was the ruler of ancient Egypt, will release all his slaves and God will take those people under the hand of Moses and take them out on a journey towards the promised land. All of that is just a principle or pattern for where we are today. And Moses, in the midst of that, calls the elders of Israel and said, listen, here's what I want you to do. Find a lamb. He calls it the Passover lamb. And he gives some instructions of what they should do in verse 22. He says, you shall take a bunch of hyssop. Hyssop is, a, is like a bush. And dip it in the blood of the lamb that's in a basin. Strike the lintel and the doorpost of your house with it. The lintel is a cross piece of the door. The doorposts are the ones that come down the side. Put blood on the lintel and on the doorpost. None of you depart from your house. Do not go out of your house until the morning. Stay inside your house. Inside that mark of the blood on the lintel and on the doorpost. Verse 23. For the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and he will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to strike you. That's the story of the Passover lamb. It's a story of deliverance in a day of danger. It's a story of the shielding of God or the salvation of God in a day when life is falling apart. In a day when disaster is coming upon the earth. These people are in their houses and they are kept safe. The disaster passes over them. Why? Because they killed the Passover lamb and they applied the life of that lamb because the life is in the blood. They applied the life of that lamb and painted blood upon their lintels and upon their doorposts. That's the story. That is what John is referring to when he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Later on we see Apostle Paul writing about Jesus. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. He says, Indeed, Christ, that is Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb was sacrificed for us. Our Passover lamb was sacrificed for us. Indeed, Christ, our lamb of God, our Passover lamb was sacrificed for us. And when his blood or his life is applied to the lintels and the doorposts of your life, disaster transgression, death, power of the enemy passes over you and you are kept safe. As long as you stay inside the vault of that salvation, Christ, our Passover lamb. When Jesus died on the cross on Calvary Hill and gave up his life for us, 
just like the Passover lamb, his blood, which represented his life, was offered up to God on our behalf. Three days later, he was raised from the dead by God, showing that death has lost his power to imprison us for all eternity. This activated a massive transaction to benefit us. This is the operations of the mission. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He's our Passover lamb. He offered his life upon the cross of Calvary. His blood was shed. His body was punctured. His blood flowed out. And that blood was an offering unto God. And that offering was made for us to give us a possibility and a hope. And it activated a massive transaction. Three days after he died, he came back to life and showed himself to people that he is now resurrected, that death no longer has final power over the human experience, that we could die and still enter into life. Well, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, it says this, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, or the life of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The blood of Jesus, which represents his life, the son of God, purifies us, or cleans us, or sets us free from all sin. Let's look at the operations. This transaction of deliverance, of purification, of cleansing, and salvation is activated by a faith declaration that has to come from our lips. This is how it gets activated. He did the work. He died on the cross. His blood was offered. But it has to be activated and made real. And it's activated by a faith declaration that comes from our own lips. And we see that in Romans chapter 10. Verse 9 and 10, Paul says this, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart, two things, in your heart which was once corrupted, now you believe, that removes the corruption, that cleans the inside. If you believe in your heart and you declare it with your mouth, that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That God raised him from the dead. That he is the savior. That he offered his life. That he is not dead, he is alive. If you declare it with your mouth and believe with your heart, a mysterious spiritual transaction gets activated. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it was with your mouth that you profess your faith. And you are saved. It's right there. If you believe with your heart. And proclaim it with your mouth. You activate something. Salvation. Set free. Back into fellowship with God. Doors open for you for a life journey. Forward in God. To meet the circumstances. The events ordained by God for your life. Blessing and favor. Out before you. God opens a door that was shut. If you declare with your mouth the Lordship of Jesus, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And for many of you listening to me, you remember this moment when you believed and you proclaimed it. It is with your heart that you believe. That's the internal work of conviction taking place in your heart. And you are justified but it's with your mouth that you profess your faith, which is in your heart, and you are saved. So we are saved from the power and the dominion of sin. That's what we are saved from, the power of sin and the rulership of wrongdoing, the rulership of sin, the rulership of bentness, of being bent, the rulership of being twisted, the rulership of always doing things that we regret. We are delivered from that, the power and the dominion of sin. We are saved from the power of the devil. 
to destroy us and everything in our life, to make sure that our future is one of frustration and pain and regret. We are delivered from that, from the power of the devil to destroy us and everything in this life. But we also are saved from eternal hell. We are saved from damnation. And we are saved from punishment from God. But what do we receive? We receive the power to live a righteous life that fully pleases God. The power to do it. The internal strength, power, and assistance from God to live a righteous life. A life that God is pleased with. We receive assurance that death is not the end of us. That after death is the beauty of an eternal life in the presence of God. We receive that assurance, that guarantee, that knowledge. That the day you breathe your last, that you will not lose consciousness. That the minute you stop breathing in this life on this earth, that you enter a bigger and more eternal life. Because Jesus rose from the dead and he's our Lord and our Savior. What do we receive? We receive the power. We receive the favor. We receive the resources of God directed towards us in this life. Here. Every day. When we walk through this life. Walk through difficulties that we face us. Walk through choices that we have to make. Walk through all the issues that is part of mortality and part of living. But in doing that, we receive the power and the favor of God, the assistance of God, the blessing of God, divine resources coming towards us, directed towards us in this life. Like a searchlight from heaven is shining down upon you. Because now you have been found, you are no longer lost. Now you are in light, you are no longer in darkness. And God over time as we walk with him, shifts your life around and bring you into a place of pleasing God. That is what we receive. The transaction of salvation. The transaction of salvation is instantaneous. We looked at the disaster that overtook us. We looked at the, what it produced in the corruption of the heart. In the empowerment of a dark system that oppressed and abused us. We looked at the hero who came into the earth. Heaven sent, but earth born. We looked at his mission which was single and powerful to seek and to save all those who are lost. We looked at how he searches for us and finds us, puts us on his shoulders and takes us back to a place of safety. We looked at how he, the woman looked for one coin that was lost and she swept the whole entire house until she found that one single coin. She searched carefully for it. We see the heart of God in tracking us down. And bringing us to a place of salvation. We saw the power of the Passover lamb Jesus Christ. Offering his blood so that we could be set free. That we could be released. That we could be saved. That we could be made new. The transaction is instantaneous. It doesn't take long. It's immediate. Once you believe and declare with your mouth. Something mysterious and spiritual happens. It's instantaneous. The transaction is now. It happens whenever you confront God. Right here, right now, this moment, wherever you are, sitting in your house if you're listening to me, on an airplane, in a car, walking in the street, wherever you are, in whatever your condition, it is now. And that transaction is available to all. That's the beauty of it. It's not class-based or education-based. It's not ethnic-based. Or based on nation. Any person. Anywhere. No matter who you are. Where you came from. What was your past. What you have done before is of no consequence. Life begins at the moment of transaction. That is when everything is made new. All the past is washed away. And forgotten by God. And you start again. That's why we say. To receive Jesus. You are born Again, it means you start from the moment that you make that transaction, that you believe in your heart and proclaim it with your mouth. Everything that is negativity, everything 
that has marked your life disappears in the eyes of God. And he starts fresh and anew and says, from this day, this is the beginning of my life with you. When you stand before God for judgment, he will not refer you to what you did 20 years ago. He will start from the point at which you met him. That's when it starts. What a great renewing opportunity that is to walk fresh with God. The transaction is instantaneous. The transaction is now. The transaction is available to all. We can be saved in an instant and we move from death to life by the power of God. These are my last words. God is real. God exists. He's real. Salvation through Jesus Christ is real. The power to be transformed and live a righteous life is real, not imaginary. It will sustain you. It will manifest itself as real in your life to transform you and everything around you. It is available right now. The power of salvation is available now to us in this broken world. The world is falling apart. The heart of man is rotted. It will not improve. We will continue to be plagued by continuous reports of disasters, of wars, of breakdown, of cruelty, of wickedness. It will not cease until the end comes and Jesus returns for those who believe upon him. But in the midst of that, there is this great shining possibility of redemption of salvation and many of you sitting here listening to me today I know in your hearts you're saying yes I've proven that to be true I am a literal proof of the truth of salvation and of the fact that God can take a life and he can bring his will and his purpose through a life and have you walk inside of his divine favor and his divine blessing all the days of your life. Let's pray. Pray for all those listening upon me. Father, come down in your strength and power through these words that I've spoken. Words of life. Words of hope. Words of truth. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, convict hearts hearts that they may rise up let light shine into the darkness of hearts today cause the light of God to come forth in us in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus well you have listened to this sharing and you may be convicted by the Holy Spirit of your need to give your heart to the Lord Jesus and to allow him to bring security and transformation to your life. If you want to move forward, then close your eyes, let your heart be still, and repeat the short prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and gave your life for me. I believe that you rose from the dead to give me assurance of eternal life. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Cleanse me from my state of sin and give me a brand new life in you. Thank you for giving me salvation. Thank you for making my life right with God. Well, I want to give you some next steps, four essential next steps. Now that you have given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to give you four essential immediate next steps that I want you to do now. Number one, call someone whom you know is a good believer in Christ and share with them what you have done. This confession to others of your new salvation is very important. Step number two, get yourself a modern version of the Bible. Ask for advice if you need assistance. Begin to discover Jesus by starting to read the Gospels. 
But I suggest that you begin with the Gospel of Mark, the book of Mark. Start with that one. And you're reading to try to find out who Jesus really was. What did Jesus say? What were his life's teachings and his standards? Get to know Jesus from the Word of God. Number three, immediately begin to attend a stable, good quality, Bible-believing church where righteousness and a good lifestyle, these things are strongly upheld. So do that. Get advice from your uh, believing friends, your born-again friends if necessary, but attend a good church. If the church you discover is not to your liking, then find another one. But make sure that you are comfortable with the standards, the values, the community, and the, the teaching, and the lifestyle of that community. That is also very important. And number four, I want you to begin to talk to God, or I want you to begin to pray. Talk to God as you would share your life, both the good things and the bad things, with a loving and a caring parent. Remember, God is now your heavenly Father, and He wants you to be aware of His presence now in your life. So do these four immediate things. And you can even uh, go forward and listen to the whole teaching again uh, so that you will be strengthened and encouraged as you move forward. The future is now open before you in God. Go forward and be mightily blessed. God bless you.